Thanks for taking the time to view our presentation. Uh, this presentation was delivered um, on September 20th, 2024, at the National Council of Measurement and Education's annual Classroom Assessment Conference in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, today, I'll be talking about ChatGPT specifically and how you can use ChatGPT to create formative and summative assessment items to create what we might call a classroom assessment system. Big shout out to my PhD student, Morgan Lowe, uh, who uh, was essential in doing this work. Uh, and also our former, uh, my former advisee, Rebecca Ito, who is now the principal of Indiana University High School uh, at following her completion of her dissertation, taking some of the ideas I'm gonna be talking about in general today, this sort of assessment framework with you, that we're using and applying it uh, to IUHS. Um, in her capacity, uh, Dr. Ito has overseen uh, several ambitious projects that uh, we were happy to be part of. One was the Course Design Academy. This was a $2 million effort to create new online courses that was funded by the Indiana Governor's Education Emergency Relief Fund. Uh, another one that's directly related to this project, that in fact Morgan is working on her master's thesis on one of these courses, was the Indiana Course Access Network. This was funded by a $3 million uh, federal grant. Uh, additional support that, uh, behind this work from grants from Google and uh, the IU Office of the Vice President of Information Technology. So the term classroom assessment is a little misleading now. Uh, since uh, most people, most educators, administer uh, assessments e both in the classroom uh, and online using a learning management system or even just Google Forms. Uh, while this has streamlined the administration of assessments, it hasn't made it any easier for educators. Many educators and instructional designers really struggle to create effective assessments. There are validity concerns over traditional items, uh, but there's also efficiency concerns with so-called alternative items like performance and portfolio assessments. Teaching to the test, or what Messick uh, called construct relevant easiness, is an enduring problem. Uh, many educators struggle to create effective items. The paper uh, that this presentation is based on leads with the sentence that creating educational assessments is uh, tedious for most and difficult for many. Uh, it gets at a lot of very challenging things. Transfer is a very confusing and difficult concept uh, for, for many educators. Uh, for example, these best answer multiple choice items that are uh, relatively difficult, like the professional item writers create, they're really pretty difficult to create. And, um, and meanwhile, formative assessment really hasn't lived up to its promise. Um, individualized feedback is laborious uh, to provide. Uh, teachers and designers, they struggle to align formative and summative items. Randy Bennett characterized the uh, effect sizes in Dylan Williams and uh, Paul Black's famous uh, article and book, uh, an educational urban legend. And I'm inclined to agree with them for reasons I'll elaborate. Now you came to this session because you're interested in generative AI, so I don't think I have to say very much here other than point out that uh, it really creates both challenges and opportunities for student assessment. You see in the popular media, lots of stories about cheating um, and then stories that cheating was overblown. And then, but you also saw quite a few stories that ChatGPT in particular is uh, leading to promising changes in assessment reform. There is a lot of research on digital technologies and particularly AI in assessment right now. There you see eight separate systematic reviews of that literature uh, published since 2020. Um, I'm currently summarizing and doing a meta meta analysis of these, so to speak, uh, in a report that I'm preparing right now for UNESCO on uh, AI and a higher education assessment. I bring a very particular uh, theoretical framework and assessment framework to the work I'm going to talk about today and to my work really over my entire career. 
Uh, I was very strongly influenced by the Ruiz Primo Chavos and Hamilton and Klein article in Jarst back in 2002, where I learned about their notion of assessment levels, this distinction between immediate, close, proximal, distal, and remote assessment levels. But at that time, I was really rethinking assessment from a very strongly situative perspective. I studied with Jim Pellegrino and brought a very cognitive uh, perspective to uh, assessment. But as a postdoc at ETS, I really came to believe that situative theory uh, really had a lot to offer um, it solving enduring problems in assessment. So that's what I've done really throughout my career. Uh, upper right, this theory level and function. So um, I really explored uh, the alignment of these different levels of assessment uh, and it deeply explored the argument that a situative perspective allows the same assessment to serve multiple functions, but for different forms of learning. I'll return to that later. But within all of this, really across all of this, is this idea of a multi-level assessment framework where you're aligning uh, instruction, formative assessments, and summative assessments. Um, one of the biggest challenges I have faced in, in getting this model out there and getting people using this model is that it requires a lot of assessments. And it turns out that, that many educators, I know in the lower left, uh, in the pandemic, we published this one really simplified version of this framework for teachers. And uh, in the course development uh, project that I mentioned, um, well, we really struggled, frankly, in that project. We ended up having to abandon uh, our, our goals for using this model because the teachers just, we didn't pay them enough to create the kinds of assessments that they needed to make it work. So uh, what I'm excited about and what I wanna talk about today is how amazing ChatGPT is when it comes to creating and helping educators learn about assessments and the alignment of assessments. So in this presentation, I want to describe a promising synergy between ChatGPT, LMSs, and this assessment framework. Uh, the synergy promises to relieve educators of the burden of creating assessments, help educators align learning across uh, levels, minimize construct irrelevant easiness, so-called cheating, uh, teaching to the test, and minimize the threat of GAI-powered cheating on summative assessments. Uh, my broader goal in this research is helping uh, people transform their assessment, in particular, uh, helping UNESCO help uh, universities in the developing world who may only have access to ChatGPT and Google Forms, uh, but could really do quite a bit with this model uh, improving their assessment. So Ethan Mollick is awesome. If you are not following his Substack and you're at this session, I'm, I'm surprised, frankly. I think he's brilliant. Uh, his, his book is great. Uh, and his, his, his writing is really, really visionary. He's at the Wharton School. Um, and he has this idea of cheap variation. And this is a way of getting around the fact that professional item, items, item writers are very expensive. At least they were. Um, I suspect many of them are looking for jobs now because of ChatGPT. But what, what Ethan pointed out is that AI allows you to generate multiple versions of a paragraph, titles, and as it turns out, assessment items. And, and that has massive potential for improving classroom assessment because uh, it allows designers and uh, educators to choose from pools of items. And in doing so, as I'll show you, it reveals important nuances that might otherwise be obscured. Um, within the the literature, this stuff was hard to find. There's so much stuff about uh, GAI and assessment, as I mentioned, but there's relatively little. We located about 10 articles on using GAI and specifically ChatGPT to create items. Uh, and here's the good ones. The one at the end is really the best. While it's focused on medical education, right? You may know that in medical education, they uh, their their tests use scenarios. Um, and those are really, really hard to create. And um, But there are other guidelines in there that are very widely available. I strongly encourage anybody who's interested to check that out. We intended on putting some of those guidelines in our paper, but in the end, we just save the space and uh, refer people to this other page, paper, I mean. 
So I'll be presenting a case study based on a course that I've been teaching since 2009. Morgan completed this student as, as a PhD student and has since been participating in this research. Um, it is a context in which I've done extensive iterative and refinement of a broader framework that I call participatory learning and assessment. We use Popham's uh, popular textbook. Uh, I'm going to focus on chapter 13 today, making sense of standardized tests. And as I'll show you, we targeted an external standard from the Burroughs Institute of Testing. So in this case study, we use ChatGPT for Omni to create three types of items. Uh, and I'll talk about these extensively, the proximal open-ended formative self-assessments from that text chapter and detailed answer explanations for formative feedback, then also proximal multiple choice summative self-checks also from the text chapters, also with answer explanations, and then uh, distal summative multiple choice items for external standards, right, for that standard I showed you. Um, and those were administered securely in a time limited exam. So I'm going to be going back through each of those uh, in order. What I'm going to present now is basically a set of steps, uh, one after the other, to create uh, what we call this assessment system. So proximal items are curriculum oriented because they're directly derived from the curriculum. Um, now you have to provide the content because it's not contained, the large language model. It knows a fair amount, and for Omni knows a fair amount about uh, Popham's work and Popham's textbook, but it really hallucinated. So what you do is you just upload the entire chapter. You just include it as a prompt, uh, and before you enter that text, and and you can we were able to put about half of a chapter at a time into for Omni, and just the prompt is create ten open-ended formative assessment items and answer explanations, and then as I'll show you, we often said now make them harder. Now make the explanations more detailed. This is a really important thing about prompt engineering. And a nice thing uh, is that you don't, many people don't realize that ChatGPT knows exactly what you're doing. So you don't need to put the whole prompt back in. You just say, hey, make them harder, make them more detailed. ChatGPT for Omni was unbelievably good at creating items in this fashion. It was easily able to identify the primary topics and created very good answer explanations. So in our case, these were administered in Canvas as an ungraded survey. So that's what an item on grade equivalent scores looks like, um, right? So this was generated uh, by ChatGPT based on the chapter um, per my request. Um, and now I've, uh, you know, I've very easily installed it in a ungraded survey in Canvas and uh, we very carefully crafted these instructions. First, we tell the students they should be able to write an acceptable answer to the question, right? They're not that tough if they did the assignment. Um, then if you can't write much, you should search the web or the textbook for more information. And then finally, uh, you should carefully compare your answer with this more detailed answer explanation. We know that as students engage in this fashion, uh, we know this from prior research, that you've got them really set up, you've got them really focused. As I'll explain later, they've engaged in a very personalized way of engaging with the chapter. And now this is abstracting it a bit and making sure that they understand the sort of more general concept. And so these are ungraded. Um, I actually don't follow up and check and see with the students. There's no punishment in my class if they don't complete them. Uh, it is an open question, say in an a undergraduate context, uh, whether or not you would want to assign points for actually completing them. Next, you want to create multiple choice proximal self-checks. These are also proximal. They come directly from the chapter. Uh, and there you see the prompts again, uh, make them harder. Uh, and uh, again, ChatGPT was very, very good at this. We use, I use open source self-check plugin for Canvas. Um, I'm not certain that was the right choice, but I stuck with it. It's a little difficult to do this in Canvas. Um, what I don't like about it is it actually deposits student score on these self-checks in the gradebook that then has to be overridden when you assign them points. So here's what this looks like 
in the self-check tool. Those of you who use Canvas, you can access this. Um, it basically embeds the assignment inside of the self-check. And so this appears at the bottom of the assignment. And students must complete all of these questions before they're allowed to submit the assignment uh, to be graded. So, OK, so, you know, straightforward question. Uh, let's say they check C and then they get this kind of feedback. And this is your fairly standard single paragraph feedback that explains in a pretty terse way uh, why the item is correct or incorrect. Now, of course, once you've transformed content into a multiple choice item, you've really reduced the value of the feedback. So this is really just a check. Um, I, I feel pretty strongly that giving feedback on multiple choice items has a relatively limited value unless they're going to see that actual item again. I will say what's most important, though, is you don't compromise your summative assessments by making them too similar to these items. And I'll return to that in a minute. Now, the self-check I just showed you was a relatively simple one, and it gave the same feedback for every response. But as you can also do in uh, Canvas, is you can give item-specific feedback. Now, I want to make another point here, and that is, is the ChatGPT not only can further refine items, but it, it uncovers amazing nuances because the prompt was answer that previous item and explain each of the answers. And ChatGPT went a little off the rails and actually stated that answer B may seem plausible, but it's incorrect. So it added this additional nuance. And I am actually not certain that that is correct or not. And I wonder what the audience thinks about that. But, but if that's true, about grade equivalent scores. So there's a, a bunch of nuance in there. So my point here is that when you feed an item into ChatGPT, it is amazing what it can do in terms of generating very detailed item by item feedback that you can give to students. So you actually can do some pretty heavy lifting. I'm rethinking my earlier sort of prohibition on uh, formative multiple choice items because of this kind of feedback. So we've got quite a bit of research to do here on this particular feature. Our next step is creating distal summative multiple choice items from a standard. So distal items are standards oriented. They need to be independent of the curriculum. They're really necessary if you want to make claims about achievement. Um, Right, proximal items are too aligned to the curriculum to make claims about uh, the, the construct of achievement. Now, distal items can be valid evidence of likely transfer. This is where my situative framework takes me in a very different direction. Many people insist that multiple choice items can't measure transfer. But if you have good best answer items that haven't been directly taught to, um, I argue that they can. And in fact, they probably are better evidence of likely transfer compared to performance assessments and particular portfolio assessments because the massive amounts of construct irrelevant variance and potential easiness that gets inserted from feedback on interim uh, artifacts. So the prompt was create 10 difficult best answer multiple choice test items and answer explanations for the following professional standard. Each item should have more than one plausible answer for less knowledgeable test takers. Explain the answer choices. And there you can see the standard, and it's a fairly straightforward one from the Burroughs Institute. So this is where many educators really struggle, and this is what professional item writers used to get paid very well to do. And again, I'm not sure if they're losing their jobs or not, but if they haven't yet, they're going to. Um, Right, which is the most appropriate measure for making this comparison, which is the most accurate statement about uh, grade equivalent scores. So you can make these really challenging and uh, you can make multiple variations of them and you can choose the ones that not only are the most effective, but are also require transfer from the formative item. As I'll elaborate, the alignment across these uh, formative uh, and summative proximal items makes it possible to make a really challenging exam. Not only that, but uh, I also include content in the instructions. I warn them, there's content in the quiz that covers parts of the assignments that were made optional. Uh, and that's fair because they've gotten opportunities to engage with that uh, engaging with their peers who did complete the option, but they also were given formative assessments that covered that content. 
You know, this is probably the most exciting part of this work for me. It's probably the most confusing for my audience. Um, but construct irrelevant easiness is a loosey goosey thing, right? Um, right? Teaching to the test. Everybody understands teaching the test. Well, a lot of people really don't understand. A lot of educators, in my experience, don't quite know what's going on with teaching to the test. Uh, humans have unlimited long term memory for recognition level learning. We know this. They've studied this. You can, you can uh, learn just millions of things well enough to determine whether or not you've seen it before. This means that mere exposure to phrases, even if you don't process that information deeper, makes it possible to subsequently recognize the correct answers in items if they use that phrase. Uh, many educators, for example, in their lectures will use the same phrases in their counterexamples as they use in their summative uh, assessments, and that's really problematic all over the place. This leads to problematic construct irrelevant easiness. Um, one of the big issues is that many educators really struggle to balance credibility and validity, right? Your formative and summative items must be similar enough to motivate student engagement. They need to know that taking the time completing the formative assessments is in fact going to impact performance on the summative exams, but the formative and summative items must be different enough to require transfer. Uh, this does require content knowledge, but that's something most educators have plenty of. But it's still difficult to generate aligned sets of pools, sets of items, and it's much, much easier to select items from larger pools. Let me show you what I mean. The top pair on standard deviation, a student would have to process and, and, and engage with that text, that answer text. Standard deviation provides a more comprehensive Hence, a measure of variability as it considers a deviation. Well, the correct answer is the spreader volatility, right? So it doesn't include the same phrase. Whereas the, the grade equivalent item at the bottom, uh, a student's relative performance, that same phrase appears in both items. And this is what I mean by uh, the way that uh, summative items get compromised. It's very difficult to write pairs of items like those in the top. Uh, experienced educators know to tweak the wording, but the really nice thing is, is when you have 10 items uh, uh, to select from, or three or four, you can just select the items that accomplish this for you, and you can do this across all three levels. And for my money, that's really a game changer. So Morgan and I previously had invested huge amounts of energy making the three exams in this uh, course unsearchable. Uh, we determined that we estimated that 55%, uh, right? So the lowest student score was just above that, um, right? We, we rewrote items and rewrote items until the answer didn't turn up uh, quickly in search within the two minutes per item they were given. And we were pleased when Chat 3.5 came out to see that it didn't do any better than, than Google search. We were a little blown away when 4.0 was released. It did a lot better. And for Omni, um, basically close to 100%. So this means that it's very, very difficult to secure an online exam. We know this now, this is all over the literature. Um, we certainly aren't gonna consider proctors, which are very invasive and discriminatory and quite expensive. So clearly we had a problem. Now, I, this is a graduate level course. This isn't that big of a deal, but what I mean, this is my test bed. And, and as the Australian uh, testing agency pointed out recently, there comes times when you need to know what students can do on their own without ChatGPT. Well, you're gonna pretty much have to bring students into a classroom and you might even have to have write the answers out longhand uh, to find that out. But in this course, um, we certainly weren't gonna do that. Rather, we suggest you minimize the impact of cheating by aligning across assessments and then reducing the exam value. Right, so, you know, the alignment, if you do it right, it makes it easier to learn than to cheat, right? If it's not that difficult, if it's these little steps that have to require transfer each of the way, then you can reduce the relative value of the summative exams. And frankly, if the students cheat on them, it's just not that big of a deal because it's very difficult to, uh, to go engage as intended and not learn this content. Now, I'll, I don't have time to talk about it. I talk about it more in the paper. Uh, my assignments are open. Students can uh, 
look at each other's work and comment on each other's work. And after they complete the proximal self-assessment, there's an engagement reflection that asks them to engage on their engagement. And in my course, that's how I award students their points. The second point here is that when you maximize personal engagement this way with automated assessments, right? So I spend about 90% of my time over there all the way on the left doing what I do best, which is giving very detailed personalized feedback in, in threaded comments directly on student work. I've been teaching this course for 20 years. It's something I'm extremely good at. And what I can do in that setting is move the conversation to a much higher level where it's appropriate. And for instance, I have doctoral students in this course alongside um, high school teachers who are just trying to teach dual credit. So I, I have an enormous range. And so what I'm able to do is, is spend all this time moving this content forward in threads. And also, I think very importantly, um, uh, introducing new concepts in the context of those discussions that would otherwise overwhelm many of the students if I actually built it into the assignment. So that wraps up that part. That's what I call this multi-level assessment framework um, that we're um, promoting. I think there's another important thing here that I really want to explore. I removed this from the paper because it, uh, there just wasn't space, but I'm really excited about it and I really hope to find a way to fund research on this, right? So most of you are familiar with so-called interim assessments, Laurie Shepard's famous caveat emptor chapter, Dylan Willem famously called them early warning summative tests. Um, these are huge money makers. Uh, uh, the Northwestern Evaluation Association was recently purchased um, by uh, HMH for an undisclosed sum, but HMH was purchased by Veritas Capital, uh, their uh, investor group, for $2.8 billion. So, and, so case in point, Indiana's interim assessment grant program, this was mandated by the state legislature. They're budgeting $14 million this year. That's $6.6 .6 per student per test and each student can be given up to three tests per year for $19 per student. That's a lot of money. Well, the alternative here that I'm gonna briefly show you is what I'm excited about, is that ChatGPT can create hybrid items. These are both four assigned curriculum and four targeted standards. It turns out that 4Omni actually knows all of the Common Core state standards. Now you need to do some prompt engineering. Here's the prompt I use. Create five open-ended formative assessments and answer explanations. And best answer multiple choice items for a Common Core uh, literacy standard and for the very popular mystery of the enchanted amulet. Not surprisingly, uh, ChatGPT just excelled at this task at creating what, what seemed to me to be pretty promising formative and summative items. And so I think pairing these kinds of items and using them in lieu of existing interim assessments, which are just completely removed from the curriculum, uh, I think that there's a lot of potential here that I'd love to explore some more. For example, when I pushed ChatGPT to create a more detailed item, there is some interesting learning happening here, I think. So administering this assessment after a student uh, has completed the formative assessment, and then, but after they, when this, this article is still fresh in their mind, I really think that this is a promising way to more effectively boost achievement on targeted standards. So that's it for now. Um, at this, uh, this is a link to my blog, Remediating Assessment, my lab blog, and there you can get access to all of these publications I've referenced. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation.